Welcome back to Sputnik. When we discussed Ukraine on Sputnik just a couple of weeks ago, few could have predicted the pace and the shape of things to come. A fascist, anti-Semitic squad of street fighters, as some are calling them, then scarcely seemed capable of overthrowing the government, binning the constitution, and beginning a process which may well lead to the dismemberment of their country. But they have. The Ukrainian president is now apparently yet another resident of a Moscow hotel, while an unelected pretender to his post is seeking a bailout of billions from the EU, which the people of Greece had earlier been told could not be afforded, and the absence of which created the whole crisis in the Ukraine in the first place. Today we're asking the question, the Ukraine was right. Joining us now to discuss developments in the Ukraine is writer, commentator and candidate in the forthcoming European elections, Nick Wright. Nick, thanks for joining us. When we last dealt with this, it looked like Yanukovych had a problem, but that uh, it was unlikely that the groups on the square would succeed in overthrowing him. But they have. How do you account for that? External factors, I think, are, are determining here. The Ukraine sits at the crossroads of Europe and Asia. It's always been an area where competing interests have clashed. In this case, the post-war settlement, if you like, flowing from the defeat of fascism, has unraveled, arising principally from the dissolution of the Soviet Union, but also through the eastward expansion of the European Union and, of course, NATO. So the borders of Russia with Western Europe, if you like, traditionally or historically, the border between socialism and capitalism, no longer characterized in that way, has moved further to the east. That is creating enormous tensions within Russia, but also it's presenting enormous opportunities for very powerful forces in the West, in the European Union, in the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Germany and Poland seem to be playing a, a, a leading role. Who would have thought that uh, that would turn out to be the case? But let's analyze the forces at work in the square, in mm. the Independence Square, the Maidan. Uh, just describe for us, if you would, what's right and What's anything else amongst those forces? Well, th they reflect really these external pressures. Interestingly, Germany, which of course is driving the European motor in this particular incident, and generally speaking, in fact, um, its preferred man, Klitschko, is really unable to perform the role that German capital has assigned to him. And more dynamic and certainly deeply reactionary forces have set the pace in, the, in Independence Square in, the, in Kiev. And they reflect uh, not just the pressure of capital and of the Western uh, alliances, but also the unraveling of the tensions within uh, Ukrainian society. If you think of the Ukraine as being a country in which the surrounding nationalities all interact, you can see that it's a, always a, a political problem, no matter who's the dominant political force there. For instance, at the end of the Second World War, we had a situation in which, as the Nazi army retreated and the Red Army advanced, other forces came into play. And so we have uh, Hungarian, Polish, and national minorities who are um, in, in part of population movements. Take uh, the city, which is the center of the neo-fascist force in contemporary Ukraine. Before the Second World War, it was the largest population of Jewish people in the country. Now it's uh, denuded of Jews for the well-known historical reasons. And anti-Semitism, of course, is a very active factor in all of this, with the competing nationalisms and the competing commercial, political and economic interests. You can have anti-Semitism without Jews. And in fact, in the Ukraine now, there are very few Jews. But the, one of the remaining rabbis in Kiev has mm. called on Jews to actually leave the city and maybe leave the country. Such is the resurgent anti-Semitism and neo-fascism in some cases, outright fascism and others, of these forces that have now come to the fore. The European Union and the United States are going to find that a very difficult horse to ride, no? Well, they've um, 
set this hair running and they can't control it really. There's an attempt here by the forces, the most reactionary forces in Ukrainian society to make themselves more presentable to the European Union because selling this package to people in Eastern Europe is very, very difficult. I mean, one of the uh, frankly offensive things taking place is the way in which the BBC described um, the Nazi collaborators who continue to fight against Soviet power in the Ukraine after the Second World War as partisans, appropriating the term, if you like, that's... Of uh, the people the, the, that they were murdering mm. and but assisting which, the Nazis which, to which murder. Which describes anti-fascist mm. fighters throughout the whole of Europe. Mm. Uh, there's a, a serious attempt here to manipulate public opinion, to reshape our understanding of history, and that's vitally important. I mean, you have to think, I think you have to take a, an, an historical view, a longer view of what's happening in Ukraine, to see the forces that are in play today are, in some senses, continuation of forces that were in play before the Second World War, during the Second World and War, and after. Nazi occupation. Absolutely. Now, Russia hasn't really spoken yet. It's impossible to imagine that Russia can accept that the 45% or so of Ukrainian citizens who are Russian speaking uh, and including ethnic Russians in very substantial numbers in the south and the east of the country can be left to the tender mercies of uh, the revanchist uh, forces that we're talking about. So what could Russia do? Well, Russia's got national interests in here, but national interests, I think, are also uh, shot through with the economic interests as well. And there are various economic forces at play here. And uh, the various regimes, in particular uh, the leadership of the Party of the Regions, has uh, obviously had a, its eye on the importance of the economic relationship with Russia, particularly, uh, particularly gas, energy supplies. But Europe, or rather the European Union, European Union, rather Europe actually, have an interest in this as well because this is a transit point. So it's critically important for all kinds of economic interests. I mean, Timoshenko, another reactionary, mm. I irreparably corrupt and compromised figure, uh, re reflects, if you like, that dichotomy. One, one day she leans to the west, one day she leans to the east. If there's profit to be made in the deal on the east, she'll take it. If she was known as the gas princess. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. But at the same time, she plays games with the west. She plays games with the most reactionary forces in uh, uh, eastern Galicia in particular um, and is in competition for them for vote, with them for votes in that part of the world. Uh, the, 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 I, I suspect that all of the political formations, possibly with the exception of the Ukrainian Communist Party are in a state of great flux at the moment and we may well see some political realignments. Will the country split up? I mean, is, it, is partition of the country a possibility? I think it's a possibility, but I think there are powerful interests against that, both in, in the European Union and in, in Russia. I think there is some pressure and this may reflect tensions within inside the European Union and tensions between the European Union and the United States. Um, there's that fa uh, um, well-publicised spat between the USA and the European Union a few weeks ago. There are tensions there which may mean that people would prefer a federal solution to the national question in the Ukraine. And clearly, when you look at a map of the Ukraine, I mean, if you, if you impose the British first past the post electoral system on the Ukraine, there'd probably be half a dozen seats of which would be swing seats. The rest are fairly clearly identified on one side or the other. But it's a very fragmented picture, you know, it's not east and west, it's uh, there are national minorities, there are langu linguistic groups, there are economic interests. For instance, there's several dozen MPs elected in the last election who weren't on any of the party lists. They had a uh, they had a, a serious local base, so it's a much more complex political situation in the Ukraine than I think the simplistic analyses which are predominant in the uh, media in Britain and Western Europe and the United States really allow for. But the president is now seemingly out of the country and new government is being formed, but the people on the streets still don't seem very satisfied. Uh, are they not just a bunch of hooligans? Can there's a very powerful hooligan element in there, that's absolutely true. But uh, I think there's a, also one of the factors driving the, the, the movement on the streets is the deep revulsion right throughout Ukrainian society against corruption. And this is the inevitable consequence of the uh, breakup of the Soviet Union and of the uh, encroachment of uh, foreign capital 
with a particular with particular interests, and also the way in which. Uh, people were able, some very corrupt people and criminal people were able to aggregate enormous wealth. They've yeah. appropriated collective social public property. It's now private property. And with that comes the inevitable uh, corruption and with that political stresses and strains. But I think what's driving the street in, uh, has been over the last few uh, weeks has been um, uh, the actions of the far right who are particularly well organized yeah. and supported. Very interesting. And funded. And funded. Very interesting commentary in uh, in the Chinese press just the last couple of days, which pointed to the um, theatrical, orchestrated, visual nature of the protests in central Kiev, in which uh, they had a kind of uh, spectacle air about them. But for instance, um, you know, the, the, these power, these flames. Mm. Every time the flames died down, somebody would put a bit more kerosene on them so that the uh, the, the cameras had a, uh, a, a dramatic image. And I think we have to be very critical of the media in this country. Mm -hmm. I mean, Channel 4 News, which is probably one of the better news services in Britain, um, had some frankly appalling coverage from uh, Matt Fry. Um, of course, he's a... a got a, power, a big track record in Central Europe and Germany. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, and I think we have to be very sensitive to what the different forces are at play here and how these are represented in the media. The, re the political reality on the ground is more complex than it appears uh, on the surface. Nick Wright, thanks for joining us My on pleasure. Sputnik. Now it's your turn to tell us what you think in the social media review. What's rattling, Gayatri? Labour Party, what's left? Someone under the name Theresa May says, left, right, when the light goes dark and they're all in the shadows, there's no difference. They are all literally in it together. What a wonderful tweet. That can't be the real <laughs> Mrs. Yeah, Theresa May. I don't May. think so either. <laughs> but it's a, it's a wonderfully profound observation. Very cool. I must say Andrew is very sanguine about... I didn't want to embarrass them, but the unions are paying a huge sum of money, many millions of pounds every yeah, year, know. for clearly and, and clearly delineated diminishing returns. Yeah. Anyway, go on. Wake Up UK says Labour brings nothing to the table except embarrassment. And this is exactly the line which was in The Guardian uh, this past week about Tony Blair, of course. How Blair has gone from an icon to an embarrassment. Yeah. But uh, Miliband doesn't seem able to shake him off. Another good one from Russell Bland saying, how about right Labour? Quite catchy, double meaning, yet only one is correct. They're right, as in Tory right. I don't actually myself uh, accept that. We will, of course, be discussing both the Conservative Party and the Liberal Democrats, for that matter, over the course of the next months, and uh, no doubt that will become apparent. So the Ukraine was right there, to which Maya replies, NATO hawks are already swooping in. They've been waiting for this. And then Andrew Richard comes with, I believe the definite article isn't right anymore. The Ukraine was the old Soviet label. Imagine me making a mistake like that. That's all we've got time for this week. Which sadly means that's the end of the show. Meantime, you can reach us on Twitter at RT underscore Sputnik. And on Facebook, you know it, it's Sputnik on Russia Today. It's goodbye from me, Gayatri. And from me, George Galloway. It's been marvellous.